Let's pray for today's message, and we're going to go after it. Um, God, I thank you, just, just me as Tommy, thank you that I have the opportunity to, to open your word and preach and do my best to attempt to capture truth and to, to help people with open hearts um, see Jesus as you really are. And I pray that today, Holy Spirit, that you would please just load everything that, that is about to happen. Load it with your presence, your goodness, your power, your boldness. God, I don't want to just talk about you. You're, you're here. And so would you come and move in power, God? Move and reveal and take veils off of eyes and ears and hearts and let us receive for you, from you powerfully in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, all throughout Scripture, we have these beautiful, descriptive names of God. We, we see him as the great I am. He is Lord. He is Savior, Deliverer, Redeemer, Messiah. He is the great physician, the, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Almighty One. There are innumerable descriptions of his power, his might, his lordship, his glory. And our response as we see him and as we taste of who he is, as we live our lives with him, we experience him more every day in awe and wonder, in the glory of his majesty, in reverence, and in the fear of the Lord. But with all of these titles, some that I just described, of all of the ways that he has described throughout scripture, when you find yourself in a place of need, when you find your, yourself in a place of vulnerability, of weakness, of fragility, when you find yourself where you're at the end of your rope or you need comfort, I really believe there is one name that satisfies. One name that satisfies when you are, are weak and desperate and in need, and that name is Father. He is our Father. Isn't it wild that we have the greatest privilege of calling the eternal, sovereign, almighty God our Father. And that's what I'm going to preach on today. It's Father's Day. And as I get older, I think I get a little cheesier. I, I used to be like, when it came to holidays at church, I used to, there's, I think there's a part of me that was a little resistant. I was like, I don't, I don't need to do that. That's just too cheesy. You know, going with the church calendar. But when it came to today, I was like, I just want to talk about my father. I just, I really do. I was like, God, you're so good. And we get to take these times and I get to like, just bring us back to the beauty of knowing you as our dad, as our father. And so we're going to go there today. I know that so many of us here have just mixed family drama backgrounds. Some of you have had great dads. Some of you have had really horrible influences in your life and I have, again, good news for you that no matter, no matter if you've had, you know, a blue ribbon kind of dad or you've had one that has failed you time and time again, we have a father in heaven that loves you and chose you and called you by name. And when we just open our hearts to give our lives to him, he, he brings you into his family as his very own. He, he is singing over you. He is dancing over you. The, the, the very love that you see for the son, that is like his love for you. And uh, there is no greater love than this, that the son of God lay down his life for you, that the father gave up his only son for your life. And so we get to explore today that this is not just talking about the theology of God's goodness, the theology of God's love. This is about experiencing the depths and the riches of his love. There was an enormous revival that broke out in the early 1990s in Toronto, Canada. Um, some people call it the Toronto Blessing or the Tor Toronto Outpouring. Many individuals were, I would say, revived, awakened, came to life through that movement. If you know about the Vineyard Movement, that was kind of... Um, bringing individuals into a place of Toronto and seeing the, the spread of it. But then it, individuals like Heidi Baker and Bethel Church, these were all birthed from the Toronto outpouring. And a marker of that time was the Father heart of God. It was the understanding of the Father heart of God that captured our hearts all over again. And then when you see the Spirit of God move from that place of understanding, you start to have an experience 
with the riches of the heart of the Father. And so even though that was, what, 30 years ago, um, we get to taste what God has done through those experiences. It's like a well that was never covered over. And so we can drink from that well even today. And I believe that what the Lord is doing in this house is, you know, we've been talking a lot about the moves of the Spirit. God has moved powerfully in Los Angeles before, and He is doing so now and will in days to come. But I believe we have to have such a revelation of the Father heart of God, and that that will transform us and be the solution for almost every single one of our our areas of need. And so let's explore that together this morning on Father's Day. Shall we? We shall. That was the response. I will say, shall we? And you say, we shall. (laughs) I don't know about that. (laughs) We shall. It's getting more cult-like by the day. (laughs) Everyone say, we shall. Okay. All right. Matthew 6. I love a good cult joke. It's good. (laughs) Matthew 6. The context very quickly here, because I, I want to I touch on this. I'm going to do a little, little editing as I go, because I, I really want this to be an experience of his love this morning. And so just even be aware of that as we're talking about these, these passages and talking about the theology of God's love. Just, just maintain that connection of his presence, can we? We shall. That's the response, remember? Okay. So Matthew 6, Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray. They're looking at the life of Jesus. They've never seen anyone like this. They're like, could this be the Messiah? I believe this is the Messiah. Um, The way that he relates to the Father and is led by the Spirit. They're like, Jesus, we have never seen anyone teach like you. We've never seen anyone pray like you. Can you teach us how to pray? And this is the response from Jesus himself to his disciples. Matthew 6, if you can turn with me there, starting in verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. No one here wants to be a hypocrite, right? For they love to stand. These are the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues, on the street corners, that they may be seen by others. I mean, every time I read this, I'm like, oh, Lord, are there areas of my life that it feels good to be seen in my religiosity or my acts of service or whatever I'm doing? Um, Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty, empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard by their many words. So this is like We see it time and time again in religious settings that we feel like we have to have a prayer that's at least five minutes long and has these and thous and make sure that you are impressive in the way that you pray. Jesus is like, snap out of that. You're praying to your father. Pray pray in the spirit. Pray in, in the presence of God. Do not heap up these empty phrases. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. I mean, that's comforting alone, isn't it? It's like sometimes you're like, I don't even know what to pray for. I just feel, I just feel like trapped in my head, in my heart. I, I don't know. He knows even what to be prayed for. And thank God that Jesus is interceding on your behalf. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the holiness and awe. And and I love the juxtaposition between our Father, because I'm going to get into this in a bit, but um, the language here is like our Dad, our Abba, hallowed be your name. It's like in one phrase, he's saying you are intimate and close like, like our Abba, but you are holy, and there is the reverence. The intimacy of being in the bosom of our God and being at our knees, arms stretched wide. This is the the beauty of our relationship with God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Christianity, we have a lot of language about the Father. We talk about him a lot. This is, you know, I I encourage you all the time. This is supposed to be a a, a living relationship with God, not just a religion. Uh, We want to engage with him. But 
I don't want us just to talk about God. I want us to experience him as father day by day because I would never want to just talk about the father with good theology without the experience. We need to have revelation and encounters with with the father heart of God. And that is what's going to bring that deep transformative peace that passes understanding. And um, I don't even think I mentioned it yet, but today the the title of this of this sermon is experiencing the father and living in rest. And so I feel like these themes are already coming across even as we're closing worship that as we experience the father that's where we get to experience and live in tangible peace and rest. That is the true sabbath rest of Jesus. In John 14 verse 6 there's a this is a very familiar passage to most evangelicals. And, and here, here it is, John 14, 6, Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In this verse, we can see two primary elements. We can see the way, and we can see the destination. What's the way? Jesus says he is the way. Jesus himself is the way. But what's the destination? A lot of believers don't really dwell on that or they really haven't thought about what the destination is. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. So we see that Jesus is the way, but the destination is the Father. So many believers actually never come into that intimate relationship with the Father. They find Jesus, but they settle into their current theology and it doesn't lead them into daily encounter with the Father. They don't know the place of his voice, his goodness, his ways, knowing that each step and turn of life, you get to receive another aspect of the goodness of the Father, trusting his ways. Let's now look at Hebrews 1, 1 through 13. I'm going to put it up here. Hebrews 1, 1 through 13. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers. How did he speak? By the prophets. But in these last days... How many know that we're in the last days as soon as Jesus ascended to heaven and the Spirit of God came in Acts 2? That was the start, the initiation of the last days. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So we hear here that, that Jesus was a part of creation of the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, He is the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Can we see these two contrasting ways that God spoke? He once spoke by the prophets, but now in these last days, he speaks by his son. The prophets were really given language. They were giving language, unveiling what God was like. But when God wanted to reveal what he is really like, more in its its fullness, a greater dimension, what he's really like as father, we see little hints of what God is like as father in, in, um, in the Old, Old Testament. We see these little hints of him being like the potter as a, as a father. But when he really wanted to bring it in its full capacity, he's like, there is only one person that can do that job, and that is my son. And that's why Jesus came. A, to complete and fulfill the message of the prophets, and B, also to live and demonstrate and reveal something that can only be done, it cannot be done just by prophetic utterance. He came to reveal what the Father was really like. One of the many reasons that he came, but was it, this is one of the primary reasons that he came, to reveal what the Father is really like. John 17, 6, this is known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. He's praying on behalf of his disciples, praying to the Father, and this is what he says. John 17, 6, I have manifested your name to the people who you gave me out of the world. And I want to note a couple things about this passage here. What is the name that he manifested? Remember that the Jewish people for over 14 centuries had referred to God's covenant name the name of Yahweh. We can see that in Exodus uh, 3.14. It was so holy that they wouldn't even speak the name Yahweh out loud. When they wrote it, they would abbreviate it. 
Y-H-W-H. They didn't want to profane the holy name of God through unclean lips of a human being. And many people, when, when writing the name God, will write G slash D. They won't even write out the name of God. Similarly, they don't want to, to take for granted this small this small word that is so powerful and to speak the name of the Holy One of Israel. And we have the privilege when Jesus came and would offend so many individuals by how he taught and by how he prayed and by how he spoke, we have the privilege of calling him Abba, a close, affectionate term as Father. And we can enjoy all of the intimate benefits that he, he is the one also that though he is close like a father, and he is our Abba. He is also like Revelation 4, 8 says, that day and night, they never cease to cry out, holy, 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 the four living creatures, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The same God in 1 Timothy 6, 15, that says, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has even seen or can see, to him be honor in eternal dominion, amen. And what we see in Exodus 33, 20, but he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. There is this sense of awe and wonder, and he is the God that couldn't even look upon him and, and continue to live because of the holiness and the majesty and awe of God. But when Jesus came, and the blood of Jesus came as a perfect once and for all sacrifice, it brought our lives into the holy of holies, and it made our lives a dwelling place for the Lord Most High, and we can live with him now face to face, the veil removed, and we can see the shining one in all of his radiance and let the, the beauty and glory of his face shine upon us. What a privilege, what an honor to be both a son who is, is in the arms of a loving God, but also one that can behold this king of glory in all of his majesty and all of the beauty of his light and radiance. He gives us this incredible right to intimately call him Father, made way through the Son of God. So what name did Jesus manifest? He manifested the name of the Father. It occurs six times in that chapter. The description manifested is important when we're saying, how did he do this? He manifested it because he didn't just come to talk about it. He came to demonstrate the name of the Father. How did he demonstrate the reality of the Father to his disciples? The way that he was living was a living demonstration of the Father by living like a son. He lived like a son. He was a son that lived in constant dependency and fellowship with his dad by the Spirit of God. He was never frightened. He never didn't know what to do. He never lost hope. Why? Because the Father was with him. And that's the model that he gave us. His followers had known the prophets. They knew the scriptures. They were familiar with all of the signs and the wonders performed for the nation of Israel. But here was a man who lived as a son, who was intimately walking with the father, and he manifested what the father was really like. The prophets could speak about who the father was, but only the son could reveal the father. Here's the deal. I too can, can preach up a storm. I can try to give you all of the flowery language that I can to try to describe what the Father is like. I can give you all of the right theology, but if there's only one person who can truly reveal the Father to you, and that is the Son of God. If you're desiring to know the Father, it comes through the revelation of the Son. And look how Jesus continues in this passage. I love, I love how he brings us into this. He says in verse 28, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I mean, every time I read that passage and actually pause and consider it, it just makes me give the biggest exhale again of my life. <laughs> Come to me, all you who are, who are laboring and heavy laden, I will give you rest. <sighs> because I've been trying so hard again. I find myself here again. Trying hard in my own strength. 
I need to come to him. I need to come to my father. You've got the solutions, God. You take this burden. You say that you do. And a lot of us here are wondering, can I make it through? Can I make it through this week? Can I make it through this season? Can I make it through living in Los Angeles? You're heavy. You are tired. You might be lonely. You're probably overwhelmed. And Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. I will give you rest. Verse 29 takes it further. Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. If you're tired of fighting this thing by by yourself in your own strength, come to him. Let him take that burden off of your shoulders and be yoked to Jesus himself. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Tommy, you're feeling those pressures of life you're struggling. I got you, my boy. Just, just come to me again. I feel like almost he's like laughing a little bit because he's like, man, I know it's tempting to try to do this in your own strength. But come on, son. Let's do this again. Let's do this again. All these people here found themselves here today. They just need to be reminded. All right. Yep. I need to let go of some things. I'm doing it in my own strength. I need to lean in on the power of the Lord. His grace, his grace is enough. I was feeling that in worship today, that there was just this like, a lot of people here might be trying to climb themselves, claw themselves out of a pit. You're trying really hard. You're doing a lot of good things trying to get out of that pit. And he's like, I'm the solution. Jesus again is the solution. He is, he is the one that extends the scarlet cord of redemption to bring you into the power of the cross, into resurrection life, to bring a complete restoration and redemption in your life. So where does this true rest come from? I can promise you I'm not just trying to sell something up here. This is the true Sabbath rest that is eternal in Jesus. Where does this true rest come? There's only one place. It's when you find yourself leaning in to be a childlike individual, leaning into the chest of your father. That is where that rest comes from. And so I wanna, I wanna end today with three results of knowing the father. These are things that I, I believe are, are very practical in our lives. Three results from knowing the father. Number one, knowing the father gives us a deep personal identity. I mean, I, it, I don't have, even really have to be up here to explain very much that identity is one of the greatest um, areas of war on this generation. People don't know who they are. The answer, the solution, is, is coming to the Father. That is the place that every child gets their identity from the Father. And so our Father will speak affirmation and identity and truth over your life. He will replace all the lies, all of the roots, all of the pain with truth and bring healing and call you as you really are. That is true identity. It's from that living relationship that he speaks. Um, a couple of verses about identity in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Someone say, hallelujah about that. Hallelujah. Behold. Oh, you did the whole thing. About that. <laughs> Hallelujah about that. (laughs) Behold, the new has come. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. Do you see the co-crucifixion that took place 2,000 years years ago? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He prepared your life and the plan for your life beforehand that you would walk in the plans and purposes and and the good works that he has for your life. John 1.12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Colossians 3, 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Tommy, where's your life? Oh, I'm hidden in Christ, my God. I love that. You are safe. 
You are under his wings. I'm hidden in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin. Remember, Jesus was perfect, the spotless, blemish-free lamb. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is our identity as sons and daughters. We are adopted into God's family. We are those who have been made new and the spirit of God rushes into our souls and brings that spirit of adoption that lets us cry out, Abba, Father. There's a revelation that only comes by the power of the blood of Jesus that washes us, makes us new, and brings us into the truth as we accept this free gift of salvation that we are adopted into God's family. Knowing the Father gives deep personal identity. Secondly, knowing the Father brings total security. Total security. Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. Why is this guy talking about some sparrows on stage? It sounds like he's giving a riddle. Well, these are, these are the words of Jesus. You could, you could buy two sparrows for a, a copper coin. A sm- it's like a penny. And you could get five of them for two pennies. These were inexpensive sparrows at the time. Small, insignificant, low-value kind of things. But even God knows. He knows when a sparrow falls. He knows about the smallest details that happen. He knows, it says in the next verse, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. I love that verse. It's like kind of odd to me. It's like you're trying to demonstrate how much you love me, and so you're like, Tommy, I know how many hairs are on your head. (laughs) Go like this, maybe a few come off. He knows still. (laughs) He knows. He knows the number. That's that's the infinite, almighty, all-knowing God that cares about every detail of your life. If he knows the number of hairs on your head, he knows that you're struggling to make that payment this month. He knows about that relationship that is, that is really causing some irritation. He knows about your frustrations and your cares and the anxieties. And so just knowing these, I feel like he's being radical to show us, like if he cares about the little sparrows, he cares about the number of hairs on our head, the thing that, you're, that you care about right now, I can guarantee you he cares about it. This is a good father who knows and who cares, and he knows about it better than you even do. He cares about it all. John 10, he says, my my sheep, in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. I know them. He knows his sheep, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will ever snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What makes us different? What makes our lives different? We are his sheep, and we as his sheep get to trust the good shepherd. We learn to let go and to trust and not be so knotted up. We get to learn to lay down our heavy burdens. The world is going to look at us and say, yo, why are they so free? Why are they not under the same pressures that everyone else in LA is living under? That should be the goal, isn't it? We're a little work in progress. He's patient with us as we're learning to let go of those anxieties. But that's what he's turning us into. Those worry-free, stress-free, truly free sheep that know the good shepherd and follow his voice and live freer and freer day by day as we learn to trust him and walk in his ways. That's what he's doing. Why are you so free? In fact, I want to prophesy that over our lives, that in the the days and weeks to come, that you're going to get people around you like, why are you so free? It's the power of God. It's the grace of Jesus. This, this This is the grace of Jesus poured out in my life. I'm just learning to give my burdens and my cares over to him. I don't have it all figured out. I've got about you know, Michael Jackson, where you've got like the, the light up and he, I, Billie Jean was at the music video and he like lights up another, a little, you know what I'm talking about? It's just coming to me, not a good description. But for all of you that don't know, Billie Jean was a big song in the 80s and uh, 
in this music video, Michael Jackson was king of music videos, um, they would light up another kind of um, square, thank you, square in the ground as he stepped on it. Eh, eh. So some of us have only the square in front of us lit up. And you're like, I, I don't see past that one square. But I'm not living in stress. I'm going to be dancing like Michael Jackson. Because I got a father that loves me. Okay. I'm a son. I'm a son. Okay, quick. Can I share a fun story? Um, when I was a sophomore in college, I ended up living a summer in Zambia, in Central Africa. And um, I went with a family that was living there, and we were having a little vacation, so we stayed in these, these kind of, no electricity, but it was kind of glamping-ish. Um, and we, we stayed by this lake where they were telling us stories about, oh yeah, there's a few people that die by crocodiles over in this area, so maybe stay away from that. Just some innocent people um, getting their water, and then they're grabbed and dragged under. And so just be careful, you know, no big deal. Um, we are in Central Africa. So just be careful, you know, no big deal. So I went with my friend Ryan, and at the time, this is pre-iPhone, um, so I'm getting old, um, and I just had my little digital camera that was new, and so I was like, I'm going to get pictures of the sunset. Ryan, you want to come along? Sure. So we, we hike on over to uh, the far side of the lake because the sunsets are unmatched. It's glorious. And so the sun's setting, I'm taking my photos living my best life, the sun goes down, and I realize, huh, this is a little different than sunsets in the States. There's not like this like dusk period. It's like, sun down, good night, it's black outside. <laughs> I was like, this is different, and it's very dark, and the moon was not out. And so um, we're like, we better get back, stat. So we, we are kind of at this like rock formation by the water, and we start like going on the path back around, around the lake. It's probably supposed to be maybe half a mile. And as soon as we get into tall grass, that's probably five, six feet tall, we hear heavy rustling coming from two sides, quickly towards us. So we halt, <laughs> turn back around and speed back towards the rocks. We're like, what was that? What the heck could that be? I don't know, but we got to make it back somehow. And so we end up going back to back. We get these like long sticks. I don't know what we were going to do with it. And we're, we literally were back to back with our giant sticks going like this through, through this little path. And I was like, I have an idea. I'll get out my camera and use the flash and scare it off. So I, every like 10 seconds, I'd use the flash, like just in case, <laughs> you know? And... Um, we kind of made it through this clearing after hearing that rustling. And we're on our path, and we're like, oh, man, um, this is absolutely wild. And we, this is in the middle of nowhere. We have not seen a single person the entire time. And this local man comes up to us. Um, he's maybe about 50 feet away. He pauses, kind of waits for us for a second, and then he starts going the other direction. So we're like, oh, thank God this guy came to show us. They must have sent him to, to help us out because we're idiots. And uh, thank you guys for sending some help. And so we, we kind of come up next to him and we're like, thank you so much. And he's not speaking English, but we're, we're following him back. And um, all, all I knew was like a, a song in their language. And um, so I just started singing this little worship song for a second. And he sang along. That was a nice moment. And... <laughs> A little bonding time. Um, so we go actually for like a few miles because these idiots took the wrong path as we're trying to get back. And it was, it was so dark where you couldn't even see your hand in front of you one of those times. Um, but thankfully, we made it back to kind of where the campsite was, and then we knew it was just a quick, like maybe 0.2 miles to the campsite where he kind of waved, gave us a thumbs up, and we went back to the campsite. And we got back, and they're like, we were worried sick about you guys. You know, at the time, I was 20 years old. We were worried sick about you. We were thinking about snakes that could have bitten you. And I was like, I didn't even think about the snakes. <laughs> oh, man. And, um, and they're like, I was like, how long ago did you send that guy to come get us? And uh, they were like, we didn't send anyone to come get you. 
And he's like, he said that Buona sent him. So Buona was like a term that we call this guy that's like boss, kind of like a, hey boss. That's like how, how you kind of talk to, about this guy. And he, all this guy said was Buona sent him. And they just like gasp and they're like, in their language, Buona also means God. God sent him. And um, we never saw that guy again. And with my flash skills, all I have is like his foot. Yeah, I've got, I've got a photo of, did the Lord send an actual man? Was it an angel? I don't know, but I got someone's foot. It's pretty cool. And I was just thinking about that story because I'm like all through my life, even when I am an idiot and like going on the wrong path and not living with wisdom, I know none of us ever do that our, our, in our lives. Going the wrong path, going around in darkness, it's a good illustration, actually. The beasts come towards us. The beasts of life. And the Lord sends help because he's faithful and he cares about his kids. And he's not going to let anyone snatch you out of his hands. And I think about these testimonies that are like a stone pile of remembrance in my life. Like when I am worried about the next thing that's about to happen, why should I stress? The Lord will send an angel in the middle of the night to come get me when I'm being a fool. I'm his son. And so the more that you live life with Jesus, the more you have a greater confidence that he always comes through. You, you learn the faithfulness of God through every season, every calendar page that's turned. You look back and you're like, I was not alone. God was with me. That was a hard season, but he is, he is the God that is with me. And he is such a good father. He is so faithful. And so knowing the Lord, there's nothing like it to feel that sense of peace and protection that comes from knowing him. All right, finally, knowing the Father motivates us to serve him. John 8, 29, and he who sent me is with me. This is Jesus speaking. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do things that are pleasing to him. So what is our motivation in this life? What is our real motivation? If you really get it down to, to one thing, our goal and our, our aim, our motivation is to please the Father. So often our motivation can be well-intentioned, but it can move into what we think is success, what we think is success by our human measurements. Even in the church, we compare congregation sizes. You know, I, I love that we're growing and we're expanding, but I have to be careful. We all have to be careful that we're not celebrating because of, of size, a human standard, that we're actually celebrating because of the, the beauty and quality of what God's doing in lives. And it can be both and. We see it throughout scripture. They give numbers of how many were added daily to their number and there's rejoicing. But it's a heart posture. Are, are, we, are, we, are, we, are we navigating ourselves outside of the beauty of saying, this is all for the Lord. This is all for his glory. This is to please the Father. So I, I'm not saying that numbers and success is, is bad at all. But where is your heart posture? Is this to please the Father? It takes the pressure away, actually. So even in the church, we compare congregation sizes, how many people were saved. And often in our lives, we think that if we have a bigger audience, that we are serving him better. Oh, he's really using that person because they have a big audience. And the measurements are our scale. It's our scale of, of what is motivation and success. People think that success provides security. Success does not provide security. In fact, the more successful you are, the more insecure you might become because you're, you're fearful you're going to lose it. The whole comparison thing, we've got to get freedom in that area of comparison. Comparison is the thief of joy. It kills the purity of your motivation. The more that you have success, the more you may be tempted to be threatened by other people's success. But finding security and peace can actually be very, very simple. It's knowing God as your father. It's making your aim to please him. There's no situation that you cannot be motivated by that, that the simplicity of our aim and our purpose, I just want to please my father. Tommy, what about all these things? What about all these compartments of life and these good things you're doing and the things you want to see? I mean, these are great, but I'm holding them open-handed because all of this is just to please my father. Can we get back to that heart posture that we, we know how good he is, that he is so worth giving it for? 
And if we need to surrender some things, that's great. If the numbers rise and fall, it's all for his glory. This, this motivation, this aim is to please my father. And so I am, I'm not thrown off course by when numbers rise and fall or when my human measurements don't add up to what I would like to see. And the older I get, the more that time passes. I kind of just want to be an old man in a rocking chair <laughs> that spends time with Jesus. Um, I'm going to put a, a photo up on the screen in a second. Don't give it away too soon there, Journey. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's okay. She was probably so quick on it. Um, all right. I was just at the Jesus Image Conference with some people. And there were some big name speakers there. Francis Chan, Bill Johnson, Christine Kane. Wonderful humans. Love them. Now, probably the, the one that is lingering on in my head and my heart were these individuals who, I don't even know their names, honestly, but they, they are the evangelical sisterhood. Now we can put it up. There they are. <laughs> with, their, with their little bonnets or whatever. Um, and they came up for a small session and they sang off key and they just gave their simple love and devotion to Jesus. And they were just talking about how one of them lives in Brazil, one of them lives in Arizona. And just every day they go to this like prayer garden and connect with the Lord and minister to him. And they just write these little songs and love the one in front of them. Listen, I was tempted to hang with the sisters. I was like, that sounds great. That sounds great. Uh, let's go to the prayer. Let's, let's make a prayer garden and just spend hours in there. That sounds really awesome. Um, but there's that simplicity of like, I just want to please my father. I just want to sit in my rocking chair and love him well and love people well. Um, and I know that some of us here are like, yeah, I've lived in LA a little while. I kind of want to escape to the garden with the sisters too. That's, that sounds like a simpler life. Sounds really good. <laughs> let's go hang with the sisters because Tomorrow's Monday. You got a little Monday morning traffic. Some of you got to stand in line at the DMV. We got to go to the doctor. You're picking up your kids at school. You got to clean your bathroom. You got to do laundry. You got to talk with your coworkers. We got projects to do and thing, things that need to be accomplished. And we find ourselves again in those moments where it doesn't feel like you're in the, it doesn't feel like you're in the presence of God. And you're like, what the heck am I doing? I am wasting time here at the doctor's office. I could be doing some other things. This is so draining. But, but here's where the Sabbath rest comes because you pause and you connect with God and you're like, I'm just here to please my father. And if that means I'm three hours in the doctor's office and they've messed up my paperwork and I'm here another hour, I'm just here to please my father. I don't have anything to prove. I'm on, I'm on his timeline. Maybe I'm here for a reason. Maybe I'm supposed to pray with someone next to me and be present. It changes the stress and gives it to Jesus. It's, it's saying, Father, I'm just a child. I'm here today. I want to be present with you and present to those around me. And I don't, I don't have to be so stressed out about what I'm building every single day. When you take this posture, there's no room for competition. If we are each equally setting up a desire to, to please the Lord... Um, then we're not going to be competing with each other. And that's what comes with knowing the Father. It's that secret of peace and steadying that comes. It's that total security in his arms. I want to read this by Derek Prince. I was really inspired by him through a lot of it. And uh, Derek Prince says, You are held in the Father's hand. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. There's no power in the universe that can do that. Jesus said, my Father is greater than all. We have the greatest Father, the most wonderful Father, a God who is a, a God above all gods, whose hands are on the comers of the universe, who created the angels and the stars and is worshiped by millions and millions of glorious beings in heaven. And he's waiting for little things like you and me to turn up. Isn't that marvelous? I feel like it just puts it all in perspective. We're not out to build the biggest. We're not out to build the greatest. Though, in the kingdom of God, if we, again, come from the overflow and that place of yielding and surrender, I, I believe we will, we will be seeing some great, beautiful things take place. Some things that people will see that it is great and big and marvelous, but it's living 
with, with arms wide open before our Father. I'm out to please my Father. And so that's what it's all about, pleasing our Father. Um, I think some of us here today, actually, Louisa, would you mind coming up? I just want to have a little ministry time and end with communion. Um, I think some of us here today, I can feel that like pulling on our heartstrings of just realigning again to like, God, this is all for you. You are, you are so good. You've been so faithful. And I, I want to be one that knows you more intimately. And I know that that, that steadying and that Sabbath rest is going to come from knowing you, where you're going to speak identity over me, in me, and through me. You're going to be one that I can cast my cares and my burdens on every single day. And you're going to be the one that I set my aim and my focus all on, that this is all out to please you. This is all for you, for your glory.